Okay, so hello everyone. Um, welcome to the seminar on education, conflict and emergencies. My name is Tejendra Ferrali. Um, I'm Associate Professor in Education and International Development at uh, the Center for Education and International Development, UCL Institute of Education. Um, uh, this seminar series is, uh, has been running for the last um, seven years now. And I can see that uh, Anna Wilson is here. Welcome, Anna. Uh, that Anna, myself, and uh, Sebastian Hein um, uh, sat together and planned for different activities on education in emergencies at the Institute of Education. And one of the things that we started was um, this uh, seminar series. And since then, we've been running it. And most of the presentations that have uh, been organized in the past are available for, for viewing via our um, YouTube channel. Um, if you search in Google, uh, in, in YouTube, uh, Education in Conflict and Emer Emergency Seminar Series. Um, so you can uh, view our past um, seminars. Um, so it's, uh, uh, the, the seminar is uh, um, hosted by the Center for Education and International Development. Um, and um, uh, so we, we invite uh, colleagues from uh, different um, institutions, including the uh, practitioner sector, uh, to be able to engage in conversations with uh, colleagues about what is happening on the ground uh, and also uh, some of the uh, sort of seminal research um, in the area of uh, education in conflict and emergencies. Um, so, um, so today's seminar, uh, I am delighted to be able to, to welcome uh, Dr. Kate Moriarty, um, who has kindly agreed to um, come and uh, give a presentation um, at this seminar. And uh, Courtney Brooks, um, one of our MA students, uh, very kindly uh, assisted us uh, in putting this event together. Uh, Courtney, uh, show your camera if, if you can, <laughs> but just say hello to everyone. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, and thanks, thanks, Courtney, for, for, for the help. Um, and uh, uh, please uh, do um, uh, stay tuned with uh, our future activities if you are available. It's uh, great that uh, colleagues from different parts of the world uh, have been able to join the seminar. Otherwise, uh, it would be usually sort of in person at the Institute of Education, which would not be sort of uh, easily available for, for colleagues who are working in this very important field uh, you know, based in um, different parts of the world. Um, so um, just to introduce um, our speaker today, um, Dr. Kate Moriarty is a senior advisor, um, strategic engagement and dialogue for interagency network for education in emergencies. As we know that INE has been uh, the organization which has uh, uh, you know, advocated for the importance of education in conflict and crisis and has been absolutely instrumental in establishing this field of study that we deeply care about um, in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and a lot of resources have been produced um, and a lot of uh, toolkits and including most importantly, the minimum standards uh, for education in, in emergencies. So it's really good to have Kate on board and to give a give a presentation today. So Kate has been working in the field of education, human rights and international development for 20 plus years with a focus on both the development and uh, humanitarian context. Um, so having trained as a teacher, um, she later worked as a human, human rights educator for before focusing on education policy, advocacy and research for a range of organizations, including um, Their World, the Malala Fund, UNESCO, Save the Children, and uh, Amnesty International. With the consultancy work undertaken for the Global Campaign for Education, Norwegian Refugee Council, Global Coalition to Protect Education from, from Attack, UNESCO, and other civil society and UN organizations. So it's such a privilege to have you uh, you know, on this forum to, to uh, uh, listen to you, Kate, and, and we really look forward to uh, listening to your presentation. And after you speak, as you've said that you will speak for about 35 minutes, 
and uh, there will be a couple of questions which you, you, you're welcome to put them on the chat box and then I will um, uh, put ourselves into breakout rooms to, to discuss in small groups um, between ourselves and then we will come back to the plenary for uh, a broader discussion. Um, so just so you know that uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded uh, and uh, it will be available for viewing later on, as, as I said um, at the beginning uh, of my intro. So um, over to you, Kate. Thanks, Tudendra. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to, to the seminar. Um, it's, it's really exciting and I actually hadn't realised it had been going for so long, so I feel, you know, doubly honoured. It's really great to know all the things that have come before. And thank you to Courtney for your support in organising this. And thank you to everybody um, that's joined for the seminar. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, an interesting discussion when we go to the breakout rooms and when we, you know, we come back together in plenary later. Also, thank you to Jendra for that very nice introduction to IMEE. And I'm going to be talking today about the achievements and challenges uh, in education emergencies. And I've, I've got a presentation that I'll share in, in a moment. Um, and so <laughs> it's good to already hear that you're saying that IME has been so, so significant because we definitely think so. Um, and thank you also for the summary of, uh, of you know, my background. And the bit that Tajendra missed out is that uh, I, I am a doctor in international education and Tajendra has something to do with that because he was my external examiner. <laughs> so thank you very much, Tajendra. <laughs> but uh, more on that maybe later in our discussion. So I'm gonna start my presentation and share my screen. So hopefully that has happened. Can I check that you can all see that? Yeah. Perfect. So uh, achievements and challenges in the field of education and emergencies. Um, what I decided to, I thought about what the focus, you know, when Trigender invited me uh, to do the seminar, I, you know, I had a kind of free range to do uh, of my choosing and I, it, I decided to look at achievements and challenges in the field of education and emergencies uh, because this has some internal resonance to IME because we turned 20 in November last year and also I think is, as, I'll, as I'll talk of it a little bit later um, because of the current external environment. So the focus of the seminar um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about who IME is uh, you know and how we work then look at the field of education and emergencies and how it's developed since IME was established. And I'm not saying that it didn't exist before, but I, I wanted to take that as a kind of, uh, as a moment in time and look at some of the key milestones. And then also look at the current landscape of education and emergencies, some of the challenges to share some data that we published recently and some financing analysis. And of course, um, it goes without saying that I think any discussion these days uh, <laughs> inavoidably has to have a focus on COVID-19. Uh, the fact that I'm here behind a computer screen and not with you in person, although as Chidendra said, it brings extra benefits that more people can join, but you know, we're all living through this pandemic and obviously for education, it has uh, you know, a number of impacts. Just want to say before I get going that um, some of the information, well, some of the data in particular that I'm sharing during the seminar comes from INE's 20th anniversary report, which is entitled uh, 20 Years of INE Achievements and Challenges in Education and Emergencies. Um, we published that in November last year to mark our 20th anniversary. And if you haven't had a chance to look at it, um, I really would recommend it. It was um, commissioned by IMEE uh, and written by Professor Pauline Rose, Dr. Heber Salem and Dr. Asma Subari, as well as uh, from the Real Centre at University of Cambridge, as well as Dr. Lindsay Bird and myself. So, you know, it isn't just us in INEE, it has really, you know, a good external focus. Um, and I think part of the, my presentation, or at least part of the discussion, is also informed by my work as, a, as an education researcher. And as I said, uh, you know, my PhD, Tajendra was, <laughs> was my examiner, looked at um, um, SDG4 policy formulation and content, a kind of critical look at that. So hopefully some of that might come into our discussion today. Oops, I can't seem to... Oh, there we are. 
So I just wanted to start off, I won't spend too much time, but I'm curious to know what you might already know about I and the E. So I've got a little quiz, a mini quiz for you. Now I realise that probably we can't put our mics on, so you might want to jot these down for yourself and then we can have a little kind of show of hands by the kind of icons and stuff about I and the E. So do you know, Jajendra already mentioned the I and E minimum standards, do you know what year they were first published in? In 2011, INE launched regular volunteer-led gatherings for INE members and others, and the aim of those meetings was to network, share experience, and discuss relevant topics. How, do you know what these events are called? They're normally held once a year. They're going to start being held twice a year. Do you know what languages INE works in? And do you know how much it costs to be an INE member? As I say, I can't see, because I've, I'm sharing my screen, I can't really see everybody. I can just see a few faces on the side. So, um, but the INE minimum standards, as I'm gonna talk about a bit later, were first published in 2004. Um, and they really are an important part of INE's identity and the work in the field of education and emergencies. They were updated in 2010, and we're just about to start updating them again and there will be a global consultation to update them so i really look forward to some of you engaging in that the meetings that i'm referring to are the INE meetup global meetups um, anyone can organize one uh, when the call goes out you can volunteer to be the organizer you can volunteer to to join them uh, and previously they were held in person this year we held them virtually so what languages does INE work in? Well, we have five core languages, in, uh, Arabic, English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish. So there are five core languages. And how much does it cost to be an I, INE member? Uh, the answer is nothing. And if you're not already a member, I hope that you will become a member because there's you know, a rich, uh, uh, you know, there's many resources on our webpage, but much more than that, you become part of a community of EIE practitioners, activists and researchers. So as I say, I can't actually see you, so I don't know how much um, you already know, but so who are we, I need? So as I said, we're an interagency network. We have members from civil society, from governments, from donors, academics, teachers. We also have refugees, refugee teachers, and students um, and students, you know, just generally around the world. We've got 18,000 plus members in 190 countries. As I said, we work in five core languages. Although I will say English does tend to dominate and this is something we're looking at. Um, we work through this interagency and consensus approach. And for us, it's really important to have, uh, you know, to, to bring that because we believe very much in the idea as a network of collective impact theory. So where we bring EIE actors together and stakeholders together around a common agenda. And these arrows at the bottom of the screen, you know, we could be going off in this direction, you know, and not, not, not even traveling in the same direction, or we can be traveling in the same direction, but not not uh, working together or we can be working together for this collective impact and I think that is really important because while we'll see in this presentation this discussion today there have been progress you know over the the last 20 years in the field of uh, education emergency there's still much to do and this concept or this you know drawing on this idea of collective impact is a really important uh, for INE as a network it's really core to our identity. Um, and this is just, a, I'm not going to go through this, it's just a kind of visual to how INE works. So um, just to say this, these network spaces that we work in, you know, we, we, we've, one of our current strategic priorities is called, uh, is looking at uh, strengthening and diversifying INE's membership. And one of the reasons for that is that we recognise that in what were our global working groups, there tended to be, although our members are spread around the world, in our working groups, which tend to have organizational members, a lot of the participation was concentrated from organizations, donors, uh, INGOs, um, and others in the global north. And we really want to, you know, we've been reflecting for the last few years about how to change that. And then 
we've really stepped up this process in light of, you know, kind of discussions and discourses and debates this year around anti-racism, uh, decolonization, uh, decolonialization, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is, uh, you know, watch this space. We will be having consultations on this and looking to how we can possibly have a more regional focus, but it's still very much a work in progress. So why look at achievements and challenges? Well, as I already said, I need Mark's 20th anniversary in November, and this really was an opportunity for us to look back and take stock and look at the continuous you know what has what has happened what 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 progress has there been and what challenges uh you know remain and we very much didn't you know we our steering group was really clear that they didn't want it to be they felt it would be inappropriate for it to be a kind of a celebration as such although there was a celebratory aspect to it but it was really about thinking you know what what changes have happened you know and asking you know some questions about what still needs to happen um and then hence commissioning the report uh, we also had a, a a virtual event we uh, within that we had children from and um, teachers from the ukraine and colombia that spoke about why they felt education was important and that is really for us at INE, hearing our members voices is really critical we don't want just to be sitting behind a computer far away we really want to think about why uh, why we're doing the work we do and the other reason as I already touched on a little bit is the external context so we know there's a growing number of people in need of humanitarian assistance and that since 2015 when the sustainable development goals were uh, uh, signed pledged agreed or um, that had already increased even before COVID struck. So an estimate now from, from UN OCHA is that 235 million people will be need, in need of humanitarian assistance and protection in 2021. And of course, a big majority, uh, a big percentage of those will be children under the age of 18 who will need education. We know there's a growing number of forcibly displaced people. Uh, UN, UNHCR estimated there were 80 million at the end of 2020. I mean, that's a huge number of people. Uh, the majority of those are actually IDPs. Uh, I think something like 42 million IDPs and 26 million refugees and then asylum seekers and others. So, you know, we're looking at this context again. We know that these children uh, of whom they estimate to be half of forcibly displaced populations are estimated to be children having their education disrupted. Why are they being forced to move? You know, conflict, crisis, uh, climate change. So there's a whole load of reasons. Also, in terms of looking at the external uh, context, we know that, um, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. But in 2019, that so even before the COVID-19 pandemic, half of all out-of-school primary, uh, primary and secondary age children lived in countries affected by crisis. So that's a huge number. And of course. Oops, I don't know what's happened here. I can't seem to click on. My apologies. I'm um, sorry. And COVID-19 has obviously, you know, as I said, it's shaping everything we do. We know that there were 100, uh, sorry, 1.5 billion children, young people shut out of school in the early part of 2020. So that's a global education emergency on top of the emergencies that we already have. So looking back now before we look more at the current crisis i, I wanted to look back to when INE was established and i really wanted us to think about uh the year that it was established and i know this isn't just to look at INE, e but i'm sure all of you who are students of uh i think you know education and international development will although now our focus is on the sustainable development goals we know that what came before them were the millennium development goals and the education for all goals so these global policy commitments were being made in 2000. For the MDGs, you had the commitment to universal primary education and gender parity in education was one of the targets of the uh, eight goals. And then you had the six EFA goals, which interestingly, when you look at those, there are there's quite a lot of overlap between the uh, sustainable uh, SDG four. So at the World Education Forum in Dakar in 2000, a number of education ministers from several countries called for action on education um, in situations of conflict and crisis. And uh, as a result of that, there was an interagency consultation on education emergencies that was held in Geneva in the year two, uh, in November 2000. 
which led to the establishment of IME. And the reason that I went through this and looked at it, because I think it's really interesting. We now think of, you know, well, as, as, as I'll kind of discuss, you know, education emergence is now, education emergency rather, is now a field in and of itself. But it's really interesting to remember where it came from and where IME came from, which is from the EFA goals and the momentum and the strategies around the achievement of education for all. Um, by 2003, INE was considered one of the six EFA flagships initiative, and I've just got a quote here from Angela Little, who was a professor at the Institute of Education, which was that uh, it was a flagship initiative intended to assist countries to achieve the EFA goals, to provide a special focus on the related aspect of EFA. EFA that poses particular problems and strengthen partnerships among stakeholders. So. Um, you know, it, it, it was really important and recognised then in terms of, um, of, of why we had to have, there had to be a focus to achieve the, the EFA goals, there had to be a focus on crisis and conflict. And then in 2004, uh, we saw the, the publication of the IME minimum standards for education. And, and you know, and I know this is an internal. I'm going to hold this up because we have to have this on our, you know, wherever we're working at INE, we have to have this close at hand. But I think it's really important because this sets a minimum standard for education, for preparedness, for response and recovery. You know, it has five domains. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, I, even though, as I say, it, it might seem now it was published 2004 and only updated in 2010. As I say, we're about to do an update. But still, the core, the core domains and the core uh, standards will, will, are so important, and they really have become a reference point for education in emergencies. So that's looking a bit at INEE, um, but I also want to look at some other milestones, which some of you, I don't know everybody on this call, some of you may be very familiar with. Um, for example, in 2006, we saw the establishment of the Global Education Cluster to promote coordination and humanitarian responses. So if you're familiar with the cluster system, which arose after the Aceh tsunami in 2004, you had the, the, the OCHA, UN OCHA, establishing a number of clusters which was about coordinating humanitarian responses education wasn't initially established but after lobbying and advocacy by INE by other organizations I worked for Save the Children at this time and we really lobbied for that to become part of the, the cluster system you had the cluster um, the cluster established and uh, as I say if you're not familiar I really do recommend you go to the cluster you look at their website and you really try to understand because they are the key coordination mechanism on the ground and really play a very important role. In 2010 uh, there was a UN resolution on the right to education emergencies again this work this you know sets out the, the, the kind of confirms the need for education to be part of humanitarian responses and this was pre preempted by work by the then special rapporteur uh, on the right to education who you know really made the case as well as the committee for the rights of the child and made the case for uh, education and emergencies as a right because as we know, rights are not suspended during an emergency and the right to education equally should not be suspended during an emergency. Um, I'm sorry, maybe I'm whizzing through this a bit and I'm happy to, to stop or we can come back to this. I think another important milestone that we identified was that in 2011, the Global Partnership for Education extended its focus to include conflict affected and fragile states. Now we're probably all now by 2021, uh, we, we know that, that GP does this, but again, this was something else that was actually quite hard won. You know, there was a lot of work behind the scenes for this to be achieved, but it was a really important milestone. Followed a number of five years later by the establishment of the Education Cannot Wait Fund, which is uh, another multilateral uh, fund uh, financing mechanism to fund education in emergencies. Again, there was a lot of, we can, we can discuss this a bit more and some of you may have been involved in these discussions or have particular opinions. There was a school of thought that said, given that the global partnership had a focus on conflict affected and fragile states, why did you need ECW? 
I personally have always been an advocate because I think it brings that extra bit of attention. It doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, the, the aid architecture is quite clear. And I think now there's an increased cooperation between GPE and education cannot wait. And that's really important. And then, you know, you had it also the, the Education Cannot Wait Fund came out of the world, uh, was really announced or, you know, a lot of work had already happened, but it was announced at the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016. And you had these other announcements such as the Grand Bargain, the new way of working and why they're important uh, for us in the field of education emergencies and for all of us working in the field of education international development is they create the link between uh, development and humanitarian and that's now a really kind of you know that's becoming an increasing focus it has been for a few years but I think it's becoming increasingly a conversation with you know long-term protracted crisis what is the link between you know development and humanitarian actors you know you know I know when back in 2000 and you know the mid 2000s when I worked at Save the Children you know we were talking about educate you know children kind of falling th through the gap you know you had the humanitarian you had the development and then somewhere along the line the children that were in these protracted crises or fragile states as we as we they were called then were being missed so I just wanted to share some of these and say that's probably a very superficial covering but it's important to, that these do signal like real progress in the field of education and emergencies and EIE is now recognised and established field and education is part of humanitarian responses. Probably not to the extent it, it, it should be still and when we look at financing of education emergencies uh, in, in a little bit that might become clear but so there has been progress but what's the current landscape? you know we know very well all of us you know this is you know this is probably you know probably kind of undergrad level so I'm, I don't need to say this to all of you because I know you're experts in this field as well but we know that quality education you know gives cognitive protects cognitive development it supports psychosocial well-being can save lives and sustain lives it's a priority for children it's a priority for their parents there's a lot of research that's been done on this um However, despite the progress and those key milestones, millions of children are still being denied their right to education. So, I mean, I had a question here, uh, which I'll, I'll give you the answer to, but I just, you know, don't know if you know how many children, primary, secondary school age children living in countries affected by crisis were out of school in 2019. So remember 2019, the data that we used is 2019 before the COVID crisis. And the answer is 127 million. Uh, that's equivalent to half of the global out of school population, which, you know, I knew it would be high. And I think before we had this figure, a lot of us were using research from the Overseas Development Institute uh, from 2016, which was saying 75 million had their uh, children had their education disrupted. But now we see that, you know, obviously it's a different methodology and a different way of counting, and you can read about that. These figures are published in, our, in, the, in the report that I mentioned. But what's important about this is that we see that conflict and crisis remain a major barrier to the right to education. Only 29% of the world's primary and secondary school age population live in crisis affected countries, yet these countries are home to 49% of the world's out of school uh, primary and secondary age children. So you see the disproportionate uh, impact that crisis and conflict is having. And I won't spend, you know, a lot of time going through all of these, but one of the biggest shocks to me around this was the number of primary age children. Because I think maybe when those of you like me who are used to maybe looking at some of the statistics, we often know, you know, when we think about out of school children, we think, because of the Millennium Development Goals that had that big push on universal primary education, we think, oh, the figures are better at primary than a little bit less so at lower secondary and, you know, and even less so at upper secondary. Well, what we see here, which is really surprising, is that in crisis affected countries that primary uh, age children is the biggest disparity. Now, I think the reason for that, and again, you know, uh, 
do look at the report, but I think one of the reasons for that is because in other countries there has been more progress in primary, but still it's, it's quite shocking to see. You may not be surprised to learn that girls are particularly affected. Um, so even though girls in crisis affected countries make up just 14% of the world's primary school age, primary and secondary school age children, sorry, girls in these contexts make up 25% of children and young people out of school globally. So it's 70, uh, so 67 million uh, girls. So, you know, we know that across all contexts, but again, here we see girls are disproportionately affected. And just, you know, before actually just staying on that. Um, so this slide is just about girls. And in the report, we didn't have the data to look at other marginalized groups, but I think you know, we also know, and there is other data around, and more research is needed because I think there is also a lack of data, and we do really need to base our work on data. You know, other groups such as, you know, the poorest children, children and young people with disabilities, uh, and other groups are, are also really kind of disproportionately affected. Um, refugee children, uh, as I've, you know, already mentioned, the number of, of forcibly displaced only 52% of refugee children have access to education. And that is definitely a case at primary, there's I think 77%, and then it decreases as you go up the, the scale. And by the time you get to higher education, only 3% of refugees globally are able to access higher education. And we need to think, what does that mean? You know, Why is that important? It's not important just for those individuals, but it's also important for the future, for the rebuilding, for when refugees return to their, if they do, to their, their country of origin. So, you know, and also the other thing to bear in mind are teachers, you know, the, the, the burden on teachers who are often at the front line. So, um, so there is some good news. <laughs> Global policy commitments do stress a focus on education in crisis. We saw that in the Incheon Declaration, which preceded the, you know, the World Education Forum in Incheon in uh, South Korea in, in uh, 2015, that preempted the, the SDGs and SDG4, that does mention conflict. And in the education, in the education 2015, 30 framework for action. Uh, there is a, a strong focus on education in crisis. It also talks about the IME minimum standards. Within SDG 4 itself, um, in the actual, you know, this is the, something that we could think about on question, you know, should, should there have been more of a focus in the actual targets on conflict? Because it's not mentioned at all, crisis and conflict are not mentioned. Uh, in the global indicators for target 5.1. Target 5.1 talks about vulnerable contexts. So within vulnerable contexts, you know, we have to read uh, crisis contexts as a vulnerable context. Of course, they can mean much more. So within that, the global indicator for that does call for disaggregated data for conflict affected, but that's only conflict affected and not crisis affected. So, you know, arguably that doesn't go far enough. This is meant to be the good news, so sorry. And the other good news is um, the amount of humanitarian aid being spent on education has increased steadily since uh, 2012. And in particular, uh, since 2016, the year that Education Cannot Wait was launched. And you can see here from this graph that you have, well, I can't point to it because I'm not in front of, I'm here in front of it, but you can't see me. But, you know, if you look at 2012, you see it going up, uh, although there's another kind of goes up to 3.2 in 2018 and then dips back down. So why 2012? Well, um, that could be because in 2012, the then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon uh, launched something called the Global Education First Initiative, which, um, you know, a lot of people kind of questioned at the time, you know, what was the point of this? It was a kind of transition between EFA and the new what was coming next, which became the Sustainable Development Goals. But within that, he said that at least 4% of total humanitarian funding should go to um, uh, education. Um, I think that figure had been around before, but then it was highlighted and, and published. And, you know, it, it is possible that that is what had that impact. 
And then in 2016, you see the formation of uh, Education Cannot Wait, and you start to see uh, you know, a much stronger increase. And we will have to see, hopefully, more research coming out um, uh, how, on, on the share of total humanitarian aid. I mean, I have to say, I don't have the figures right in front of me, but there was a global humanitarian response plan for COVID-19 and initially education was really poorly funded. So I think we're still struggling and you still see, you know, in the report that these, these, these graphs are from, you, you see that, that education in terms of the met and unmet needs, you know, there's a huge difference. And also there's a difference between countries you know so while there's an increase a lot of that increase goes to just the number of countries and what we've seen there are kind of high profile emergencies and then they're forgotten crisis um, so if you look along some of here you see in the darker purple the the where education funding was met and then you see the unmet requirements and you see you know in so many cases the unmet requirements is 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 really significant so how, you know, how are you meant to rebuild? How are children able to go, you know, how are they meant to get their right to education fulfilled, you know, respected and protected? And I think it's, you know, again, we can talk about this and I think it's an interesting point for us to think about. And here I'm going to take off my i &E hat a bit because, you know, maybe uh, because i &E is interagency and we do have donors among our members, but we want to ask why are some crises high profile and some aren't there's a geopolitical interest behind that you know there's a security agenda uh, one might say um, that it was important to to say European donors to fund uh, the Syrian crisis uh, for either geopolitical reasons but also to keep refugees from coming to Europe in search of education so there's a whole range of of reasons of why these things happen and i think you know it's our responsibility as education activists and education actors and researchers to really dig into that um, i've just got a couple more slides and then we can go to the discussion so as i said we can't really talk about any of this without thinking about the current context we're in and you know i'm sure all of you know these figures and you know all of this but i felt it was really important to you know, to say this global health pandemic has become a global education emergency. So, you know, we, we had 1.5 billion children shut out of school and many continue to be shut out of school. You know, some schools remain closed for, for months, some are still closed, even where there wasn't a high level of transmission. You know, we uh, saw what we really saw across nearly every country was a lack of preparedness, right? The only minimum standards talk about uh, preparedness for response and recovery. What we saw that, 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 you know, that this was a crisis, you know, the words being used way too much, but I'll use it again, unprecedented scale, right? We, everybody says it about COVID. So, uh, you know, and distance education, uh, you know, it was sporadic, it was inequitable, there was no quality control. We know that, you know, even in high income countries, you know, it was, it was children from poorer backgrounds that were missing out because they didn't have the devices to access the material and in crisis affected countries, you know, where or low income countries or whether they combine, uh, you know, millions of children were not accessing distance education. Teachers were expected to develop new skills and they were often left unpaid and let's not forget they were also affected by the crisis themselves right. They may have lost loved ones. They themselves may have been sick. They themselves may have been caring for young children. So this all has a knock on impact, increases pressure on families, especially if you think about like early childhood education, uh, you know, pre-primary, you know, the focus, if you're an older child and you do have access to some, whether it's high tech or low tech distance education, you may be able to concentrate on yourself. If you're a young child, a lot of the burden goes on to parents who are already feeling the pressure, economic pressures uh, themselves. And obviously, another thing that, you know, and this is something we've worked on at i &E a lot, and we've got a new report that um, I hope you will look at coming out in, in about two or three weeks time on the impact of school closures. Um, 
we've worked with the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. Earlier this, sorry, last year, we published a paper called Weighing Up the Risks, where we said, you know, that while it was understandable that schools were closed to stop the transmission, what wasn't thought about, what wasn't considered was what was the impact on the overall protection and well-being of children. So it isn't just a loss of learning, it's also like how about all the health services that are provided, so school meals, nutrition, uh, protection, you know, what happens to children when they're out of schools? And even the fact that you know, if you're living in a refugee camp or you're living in a you know high density uh, let's call it a slum community for you know you can't socially distance so you may be better in school than out of school so what we were calling for and are still calling for is really a contextualized and balanced approach to school closures and I think the other reason and I'm, I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm nearly finishing now but the the other reasons that you know as INEE as a community of practice of, of education and emergencies actors what happens when there's a global education emergency is you've got you know 100 and, uh, 1.5 billion learners actually I should have put learners there because that is that that those figures are from UNESCO and that's how they referenced it and they did that because they were children already in school so what about those countries that were already experiencing humanitarian crisis before COVID and now have the extra burden of COVID where you know what about the young children and uh, so the children and young people who are already out of school so you know we really in our work at, uh, at INEE we really try to keep the focus uh, on those countries already affected by humanitarian crisis as well as support the right wider response and you know we had a series you can find all of these webinars uh, advocacy messages resources technical notes blogs etc and I think another reason and this again is something we could discuss is to think about you know we already saw that humanitarian financing is you know it has improved but it's still not enough but what is going to be the impact of COVID on financing we've already seen the UK government not COVID related I have to say cutting their their overall uh, aid budget but as economies shrink as countries all around the world feel the impact of the COVID crisis and there's expected to be a reduction in, in GDP even if the percentage going to overseas development aid isn't reduced you know even if it isn't reduced more than 0.5 the actual amount because GDPs will be declining is going to have an impact so what does that mean for crisis affected countries so that brings me to the end and to gender if I may if I've still got a few minutes I really would like to just play this INE 20th anniversary video and the reason I want to do so because this is a video we put out a call for INE members to share videos with us videos they'd made for them work or they made for themselves or photographs and we cut them into a video so it's just a few minutes I'll play this and then then we can go to our discussion so hopefully this will work there with me um, I think I have to I hope. Can you hear it? Maybe increase the volume on your side. Perfect. and a skill that made me to be one of the wise and brave. Uh, 
درت اكسب سأخ من عبد الوهاب وخليهم يشقلقون الشخص بيقدر يكون دولة قدر ساعدهم حتى يتخطوا صعوبة اللي بيواجهوا في حياتهم أو بالمدرسة أو بالبيت. Studies have the purpose because these certificates that you are getting, they will have the use in our life. I want to teach continuously because I love children very much. I have tried my best to make sure that I reach to my learners during this lockdown. So yeah, I just wanted to show. Oops. Sorry, I don't see where to get back to. Can you hear me, Tajendra? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to get to my last slide. Oh voila. Um, and so yeah, thank you for listening. Um, and thank you for watching that video because I think it was nice to to hear the voices of INI members. So I've got quite a few discussion questions. Uh, Tajendra, I'll be guided by you. How many of those we can we've got time to look at, or how you want to do it? So. Just to thank everybody for 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 yeah, giving me the time to speak today and look forward to a discussion with you now. Yeah, thanks very much, Kate. Um, yeah, that was really fascinating. Um, would you like to um, maybe select two of the questions and uh, put them in the chat box so that uh, colleagues okay. can can focus on that because after you stop sharing, we wouldn't be able to see this. Uh, yeah, that's um, well, it might also be interesting to um, talk about what we you found most striking in the in the presentation when you go to the break, breakout rooms. Um, so what ideas were interesting um, and uh, then discuss in the breakout rooms and then we can come back to the plenary. Okay, so now I'm going to put all of us into the breakout rooms, but then we will not be able to see the questions once we go to the... Should be okay. aware of pasting the questions. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to put the first two questions, well, sorry, they're quite long questions, but I'm... So I think the first okay. question really is around, yeah, what, what's, in, you know, is the focus on EIE still important, you know, and what's missing in terms of the debate, because I think as I need, it's interesting for us to, to hear back from all of you. And then just a question around, you know, education emergencies is definitely a separate field, but what does that then mean, uh, you know, is, does that mean it's separate from the wider education policy debates that are going on? And what does that mean for SDG four? So, okay. So thanks. So I'll thank put, you. Put all of us into the group. Akuza? Yeah, thanks. 
everyone. Um, so uh, we had a really interesting discussion in our breakout room. I hope that uh, you're also enjoying in the same way. Um, so Kate, um, so shall we um, open the floor for comments and uh, questions from the participants? Um, so if you've got a question, please just uh, raise your hand uh, and I'll be able to to see you and, and I'll um, um, you know, call your name and you can uh, contribute or you can ask questions. Anyone? I can uh, ask a question to Hendra, is Angela? Yes, please, yes, go on Angela. Okay, so I, uh, let me see, I'm trying to turn on the camera here. Uh, so I, I have a question and a comment. The question is uh, in the presentation from K Kate, I think was her name, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. She mentioned how uh, the uh, aid to education and emergencies had increased in the latest years. And my question would be, can it be that uh, while um, aid to education emergencies has been increasing, aid to long-term developing has been decreasing. So rather than the, the, the cake of aid having me made bigger, it's probably being split differently. So I was just wondering if she would know the answer to that. And the comment uh, the, to the questions in, in my group, um, maybe to really quickly, quickly summarize, we just talked that education in emergencies is definitely more important now than ever with all the consequences of COVID-19 and the challenges that it's brought about. And we talked about how uh, COVID-19 had simulated the use of digital tools to, to, for children to be able to gain access to education, but it again um, emphasized a big difference in, in who has access to such tools. And there is also a gender aspect there where, uh, where uh, girls, again, are not the ones that have access to digital tools. Um, and then as to what I, I, I and I should be doing, we thought about the protection of children that will have increased access to digital tools and exposed to the dangers of online platforms. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Um, do you want to respond to that question, Kate? Yeah, I think, uh, Angela, I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but my from other research that I was involved in before I was at oh. INEF, they're not so long ago, but we and we can also look up, but I think aid to education overall has increased. So it isn't that um, because aid to education generally like in, in kind of development context is coming from a different part of money generally. Um, so it isn't like one, I think it's a really, you know, it's an important question, right? We have to think if you're giving money to this and you know, quite often we're saying, right, 10% to education and emergencies, 10% to this, 10% to that. So we have to think about where's the money coming from and we have to think about increasing the overall amount of money um, as well as making it kind of predictable and sustainable over a number of years. But as far as I know, um, I'm, I'm, pre well, I'm pretty certain that the answer is, is not being taken from uh, other education and development contexts and it's not being taken from other humanitarian sectors either. But I think it probably needs a little bit more research into you know, if this is coming from overall increases of donors and how to make that sustainable. And yeah, thank you for the reflections on, um, I think, you know, on the, on the digital, absolutely. And I think UNESCO, you know, published some figures on that about who had access to digital. And I think we also know that, um, you know, girls, there's a lot of uh, information around that, even coming from very early on out of China when the schools were first closed in China about girls' access to, online education. And I think the issue around protection of children of online uh, is, is a really important question. So thank you. Okay, great. Um, Karinja. Yeah, Karinja, thank you. Um, uh, Kate, I was just wondering, um, particularly the, the humanitarian and the development sort of convergence that you sort of touched on, um, one thing I'm interested in is when you look at sort of the humanitarian 
principles, particularly when you think about, you know, impartiality, neutrality, sometimes the message can be that uh, that enables humanitarian organizations to deliver food or health assistance, but education almost can cross this line, particularly when you're dealing with an organization that are opposed to education of certain groups, for example. What do you see as sort of the development of that conversation if humanitarian organizations and development organizations are going to be working more together on the ground? Do you think that will have a sort of a negative impact on humanitarian work, perhaps? Um, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, this is such a great question. Um, and, you know, I need to, to probably give a little bit more thought, but I would say that um, no, education shouldn't be seen as, I mean, it's interesting because just in our small group, we were saying that education is not neutral, it's political, you know, kind of Ferrarian perspective of education. But what we're talking about in terms of, you know, we're, 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 I, th I think that, you know, education is a universal uh, human right. Uh, in all contexts yes of course there are certain groups who are opposed to education I, and those groups are will not only be opposed to education they'll probably be opposed to all forms of humanitarian assistance so I don't think education being part of a humanitarian response undermines impartiality I think it you know respects the core humanitarian principles and it absolutely has to be part of it because yeah. As I say, you know, rights are not suspended. And we know also, you know, the humanitarian, you know, a kind of a, a key tenant of, of humanitarian response is listening to beneficiaries and, and, and what their kind of wants and needs are. And as I think I said in the presentation, you know, there's a lot of research around there. And, you know, I, I mean, I remember when I started work in this field, you know, when I went from, you know, I came from a human rights background, I went into sort of development and there was a whole discussion, you know, even the humanitarians in uh, a development organization were saying, oh, well, you know, do we really want education as part of it? But I think, you know, hopefully we've won that argument. And, yeah. but yeah, I think it's, you know, I think there are, of course, you know, it will be down to, you know, humanitarian coordinators on the ground to assess how how they manage situations. But I think, you know, we, we most populations do want education. Um, I think it's a really good question. Yeah, thanks. Um, so now, um, Courtney, Kemi and uh, Charlotte. Hi there, thanks. Um, so one of the main questions in our group was um, about the disbursement of the 127 million children. Um, is it broadly dispersed or is it concentrated in one area or a few specific areas? And then also um, about INEE's impact in like extreme violent situations such as Yemen, um, how, how do they respond to crisis like that when it is hard to reach people with education? Um, in those settings. So, thanks. Yeah. yeah, on the 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 the, the data, um, we don't actually break down the data in the report into countries because we didn't have enough like detailed information to to be able to break it down. We worked with the UNESCO Institute of Statistics, and we had the we gave them the methodology. We used the education cannot wait list of countries that they were worked on. And then UIS gave us the overall raw data. So we don't have a breakdown for uh, all of all of that. But, you know, we know kind of looking across, um, you know, from, from some of the uh, UNESCO data itself, that, you know, if you look at those countries, you can see probably, you know, higher, uh, higher numbers in, in like, you know, large, large population uh, countries. In terms of, you know, INEE and our impact in places like Yemen, uh, um, INEE, uh, we don't do, you know, we don't do responses ourselves. We're not on the ground. Our members are, so we are a community, you know, our members are made up of many, as I said, many different actors and, and stakeholders. You know, some of those are, are, are you know, uh, they're in the country, they're from the country, they're, uh, you know, sometimes ministries of education, they're sometimes donors, they're sometimes, uh, you know, say humanitarians who have gone to respond to an emergency. Um, we don't have enough information to say how uh, the tools are being used directly, say in a, 
in a, in a crisis such as Yanmen. We think that because there has been a kind of really strong uptake, say on the IME minimum standards and how they're contextualized, that they that then filters down into the work that's happening on the ground, equally okay. some of the other tools. So I think, you know, uh, it, it, again, it's another really good question. Uh, is something that in terms of how the tools we create, how they're, you know, or produce through our members, how they're actually, you know, the impact is something that we, we aren't able you know, we can go as far as kind of outputs and possibly outcomes, but impact is really hard to measure. So, but thank you. Yeah, thanks. Kimmy? Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask, because we had this discussion in our group as well, in terms of um, when we talk about crisis situations or emergency or even with COVID, a lot of the focus is on the learners, which is important, but we wonder what about the teachers? What kind of support do the teachers get? Because I, I don't see much in the debate arena in terms of um, teacher support. And the reason I ask is we saw how with COVID, a lot of teachers had to do quick switches in rural areas and even in places where they're not very um, conversant with the use of technology or laptops. And some teachers have laptops, but then the whole internet and technology thing is not something that they're familiar with. And they had to do such switches. Uh, what kind of support does do you give hmm. um, to teachers in times like this? And also, how do we get countries to be ready for emergencies, not only when the emergency has happened, but be proactive, whether it's with policies or even with practice and um, and, and tools? Thank you. Um, Kate, um, can we take um, Charlotte's question as well, um, yeah. and then you can respond. Charlotte, do you want to uh, ask your question or make your comment? Hi, yeah. good evening. Um, apologies, I haven't got my camera on. I've had to swap to put it to my ear, um, the old-fashioned way for charging. Um, it's something I didn't get. We didn't get a chance to kind of discuss um, in our group. Um, but my question is kind of surrounding um, the change in kind of emergencies. Um, and environmental crisis um, and environmental pressures change in the environments people live in. Um, particularly, we talked a lot about kind of the geopolitics feeding into uh, the funding and how that changes. And obviously, with the establishment still coming around kind of climate policies, um, still such as a wide level, do you see their kind of being a delay um, to it kind of happening and seeing in our world and where the policy kind of catches up? Um, or is it something kind of the, the INE is looking to kind of act on and kind of feed into to be kind of a kind of ahead of the curve um, before there's kind of irreversible change? Thank you, yeah. Thanks, okay. so starting with Kemi's question, um, you know, I did touch a couple of times in the presentation on teachers. Um, and I, I did not actually have a slide on something on teachers, but I took it out for, for kind of time. But I think it, we, we do have a, a strong focus on teachers. So, you know, the IME minimum standards, which I've mentioned a lot, we have like has a section on teachers and other education personnel. We also have uh, one of our network spaces is called the Teachers in Crisis and Conflict. And we are really aware that teachers are on the front line of emergency responses. And they're often, uh, you know, uh, really, really, you know, as I say, and an emergency, don't forget, is also happening to them. So because they're part of that community. So it's not like they're outside of the emergency. They're part of the emergency. And, uh, you know, and, and we really we need to support teachers. There's a global shortage of teachers. I think to meet the SDG4, they say we need something like 69 million teachers, new teachers. And then, you know, in crisis context, it's really, it's really difficult. You know, often there's, you know, teachers are, they're not trained to the extent that that would be desirable. They're working in really adverse conditions. They're often not being paid. And this really came to the fore with COVID. And as you said, with COVID, then it was just like, oh, we are switched to digital. We expect teachers to know that. So there's a whole capacity building or capacity exchange and strengthening that, that needs to happen. So very much teachers are part of our work and really have to be a priority because, you know, as I did think I said, you know, quality education, you know, you can't have quality education and, and we shouldn't only be talking about access, right? We should be talking about quality and maybe I didn't stress that enough in my presentation, but which is unlike me because I'm normally always talking about quality, but you know, teachers are really 
key. So, um, yeah, thank you. And then for the last question, again, uh, you know, INE works, you know, on on all all, all types of crisis. So whether that's a conflict or an environmental or a health emergency, and certainly, you know, we know that you know, these crises, these environmental crises have been there, but they are growing and likely to grow because of climate change. We are currently, you know, we, we some of our members are working on that. And I know UNESCO, who's one of our founding members, are doing, uh, together with UNICEF, and I actually moderated a, uh, a round table for them recently on, on the impact of climate displacement and education, and they've done work um, on the learning passport, looking at climate displacement. So I think it is a really, it is a really, you know, important question. And, you know, it kind of comes back to like, what are the drivers of crisis, right? And how do we, how do we stop them? And, you know, climate change, as I say, this is not something we're actually yet really having a lot of focus on, uh, you know, systematically, but certainly something that's definitely, you know, everyone's aware of, so. Thank you again for, for great questions. And, um... Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, so we're coming to an end almost, um, Just, but, but I wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, uh, it was really interesting to, to listen to your talk. And also, I quite enjoyed our conversation in the, in the group uh, breakout room. Um, you mentioned about uh, the geopolitical dimension, which tends to impact on how aid is distributed. Um, and uh, I mean, in, in relation to that, um, I wonder how you see the role of INE um, in trying to reclaim the significance of education uh, for the populations who need it the most, rather than um, aid following uh, the countries where there is a greater um, strategic interest of the, of the donor countries. Um, that's my first question. And the second question or a comment is really, there's another critique um, uh, in relation to the work of INE that uh, a, a lot of critical issues relating to education, whether it is about um, unequal distribution of education um, or uh, inequalities along different racial groups, religious groups, ethnic groups, uh, and also the use of education for reproduction of unequal power relationships in, in, in a particular society, which you actually touched upon this idea of education being political. But the critique of INE is that it doesn't sufficiently question those uh, issues relating to power and politics of education. And it uh, overly emphasizes on um, the technical dimensions of education uh, in relation to um, access uh, in, in, in crisis contexts. So how should we as a community of uh, uh, educators or learners or researchers in the field of education in emergencies uh, try, to, try to push that boundaries? And whether it is also to do with the way that um, INE as a network is, uh, is um, structured because there is uh, evidence around uh, who actually represents INE and the way that its uh, activities are quite centralized. And, and I kind of worry that whether we are reproducing the existing, um, you know, uh, unequal structures of development, which has been, you know, recently critiqued, you know, in the discourses around uh, decolonizing education and decolonizing development practices. Um, just very briefly, if you could share your, your thoughts. <laughs> very brief <laughs> answers to a very long question. So. <laughs> yeah, so that's um, great. Yeah. No, they're, they're really interesting and, you know, uh, and thank you so much. So I'm going to answer this with probably with my INE hat on. And I think that, you know, first of all, INE is an interagency network and we have, we have, Yes, we have donors who support us to do our work, but we also have donors who are our members, right? So, um, 
you know, donors are important to us in, in many ways. I think we, we know, and those donors who are our, our members also, you know, are part of this conversation that we don't want to be a donor driven network, but we want the, the priorities of the network, you know, and we really do try to do this as strategic priorities. You know, we do have consultations. We do come, this does come from the wider uh, network and that, and we have to be better at that, right? So, um, so, so going to the kind of first question in terms of the kind of geopolitics, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, these are complicated questions and it's not that, uh, you know, it's not, you know, I think I was saying, you know, in the forgotten crisis, it's not that Syria isn't in need, Syria is in need as well, right? They still don't have the children who are displaced in Syria, IDPs or displaced in the, you know, surrounding countries in the regional response are still missing out on education. So there's just not enough money all the way around. And yeah, of course, we have to look at the rights of the child across every context and think about how do we, um, as I said, when I, you know, how do we make sure that all children are getting their right to education, you know, and I think we have to, you know, we have to think of ways and maybe, you know, different ways of, 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 of cutting through and getting our message across because we you know and I, and I do think this is where it is important you have donors like ECW that are just focused on educational emergencies you know and are starting to address some of those challenges so hopefully we'll see that improve and that you won't have those forgotten crises but I think it's also our responsibility you know and that's why it's in the report you know because we want to lift these things up we want to highlight them so you know we're not uncritical we're not just neutral and we're not just donor driven I think in terms of you know I need being a kind of technical focused on access and quality and standards you know don't forget that you know standards are kind of core to to our work the minimum standards about community part participation about listening of course you know these are ongoing challenges but you know in terms of what we believe in you know we do believe in a right space we do believe in the minimum standards uh, you know are we part of a reproduction of a system um perhaps in some ways in other ways no because you know you, you can also argue that you know if you give children quality education and what do we mean by quality education you know, that's an important question. What do we understand by quality education? You know, that does give children the ability, children and young, children and young people, the ability to question, right? Because we're not saying that education should just be about rote learning, you know, far from it. We're really trying to say in the tools and resources that we produce as well, that it is about, you know, uh, the kind of whole well-being of the child. It is about, you know, con conflict sensitive education. It is about, um, you know, really giving, uh, you know, children and young people a voice through education. So I hope through that, of course, you know, education systems are imperfect. And in an emergency, you know, you are also struggling to try and fulfill the rights of those child for their right to education, but also the other benefits that that brings. Mm. As I said, when you saw schools closed for COVID, what happens? Those children are out of school. They're then at greater risk of exploitation. They're at greater risk of, you know, possible abuse. So, of course, you know, we live in an imperfect world. Um, and, you know, I think what is really important, we we do have, um, just I think one, one last point. Yeah, we do have 18,000 plus members from all around the world. We also recognize that in, as I, as I said myself, you know, in the early, when I showed that network slide uh, uh, earlier on, we know that in some of our network spaces, there has been a concentration of more powerful voices like international NGOs, for example, or, or donors or others, um, rather than, you know, bringing or voices from the global north, as I don't have a better way of saying it. And we, we, we are in a process of change. We do recognize that we, you know, as part of that, uh, you know, movement, you know, we issued a statement on anti-racism. We've issued a statement on about changing the makeup of the IME secretariat of our steering group and really giving much more voice to our members. So it's a journey. We hope you'll help us. We really welcome the kind of, uh, you know, the feedback. And I think it's really important to keep asking us this question because as I said, here we are 20 years on. I think our work is still as important as it ever was, but we also have to change and we also have to recognize, you know, where we can, you know, 
as a global community. And don't forget, I and the E is about, it's meant to be focused on its members. Yeah. So like, how do we give more voice to our members? So yeah, sure. thanks very much. No, thank you, Kate. Uh, that was that was really helpful. And um, yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, in the chat box, the, there was an interesting question uh, about, uh, uh, you know, while we are trying to uh, capture the number of girls out of school, and uh, there is a risk that uh, we might be um, we might be missing out on how boys are doing, and whether they are being reported as they may have been um, sort of uh, pulled into um, you know conflict uh, groups. Yeah, and then Chris mentions about uh, um, the problems. Uh, yeah, so the IME network will become more uh, important in an area of climate cl catastrophe. How to strengthen the cosmopolitan frame uh, would seem a future challenge in the context of failing human rights. Mm. So that's a good comment. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for for contributions. And thank you so much, Kate, for um, your fascinating presentation and, uh, and coming to speak to the Education in Conflict and Emergencies seminar. And we look forward to engaging more in the in the days to come. And uh, I hope that IE continues to make a difference uh, in the times of crisis. Um, thanks, everyone, and thanks. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Really interesting. Thank you. Bye, bye.